Welcome to Inside Startup Investing, the only podcast where you can invest in every guest. On this episode, I will be speaking with founder and CEO of NetSpeak, Eric DeGiorgi. NetSpeak is a company you wouldn't think about off the bat, but once you understand the problem, I think many of us can relate in a big way. You see, NetSpeak is building what I think of as the operating system for managing every component involved with audio visuals, or AV for short, in the workplace. In short, have you ever been in a meeting where you were trying to conference in a team from another office and you can't seem to get the video and speaker to work? Or been on a Zoom and one of your teammates freezes up while trying to cover an important topic? The reality is we've all been in these situations, but managing so many different devices in the workplace actually presents a huge unsolved problem with interoperability that's fairly non-existent. NetSpeak is out to make all these devices speak to one another in a streamlined and effective way. The team that is building NetSpeak has been in the audiovisual space for most of their careers and acutely understand this pain point. Think about every office in America, and you start to realize how big an opportunity there could be to solve this challenge for Fortune 500 companies and the like. And the best part is, this team is already networked into the folks who need these solutions and are rapidly building their pipeline with major customers already coming online to beta test the software across hundreds of their conference rooms. From my days working for private equity shops, I can tell you the less sexy the business, the more profitable they tend to be. Solving an acute problem like managing AV equipment in the office, which hampers worker productivity, is just a type of software play that can scale fast and be very profitable. So with that, let's get on to the show and welcome Eric. So for those who don't know, give us a little bit of background about yourself and what you're up to at NetSpeak. Yeah, sure. So I'm coming, uh, I've been in the pro AV industry for almost 20 years, um, as well as my, some of my founding team members. Think of pro AV as exactly what we're using right now. Audio, video, lighting, room control systems, primarily for meeting rooms, conference rooms, presentation spaces, classrooms. So, um, so I've been in that industry for about 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, the genesis of NetSpeak was, um, while at my previous company, attending a major trade show uh, here domestically. And nine out of ten conversations I have were asking to help solve this problem, which really was there's too much technology in pro-AV. I, I'm sure anyone that spent time in an office or a classroom has experienced the symptom of just trying to start a meeting, trying to do your work, and things just not working. Um, and that's really a symptom of there's just too much technology, there's not a good way to manage it and use it on a day-to-day basis. So, um, you know, that was a couple years ago. doesn't really take a stroke of genius to have 9 out of 10 people tell you, I've got the similar problem, uh, you know, to go say, well, maybe we should try to work on that. <laughs> um, so we did, um, and built out the proof of concept last year, and now um, are bringing uh, the product to market under NetSpeak. That's awesome. So. When you talk about, you know, to make it real for folks, when you're in an office and you're, you're trying to set up, whether it's a virtual, you know, conference or you're, you're doing in person, you have all of these different tools that you can utilize in the office. Uh, and yet every time you go to utilize this stuff, it seems like it doesn't work. People don't know how to utilize it, so on and so forth. And whether that's the mic and the video and the video camera to the other, you know, group of people are sitting in another room, whatever it may be. Talk to us about some of the key components that are part of kind of the pro AV space and then some of the major challenges that people typically face that you're helping to solve for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there is uh, an overabundance of technology and, it, and it's not, it, it's built in siloed uh, ways and just it doesn't inherently want to work together. So whether that's hardware, you know, you've got screens and microphones and cameras, whether it's the software, you know, your Teams and Zooms and Google Meets and Riverside, I guess we're using right now for this podcast. So, you know, there's there's a lot of technology and it's been built by uh, a multitude of vendors um, and really getting it to all work together. Um, being able to, at first, just manage it. You'd be, you'd be shocked at how many Fortune 500 companies are managing their pro AV assets in an Excel spreadsheet or multiples, right? And so just getting a good grip on what do we have? Is it working? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? And then what we've done with our platform is we've leveraged some of the um, most modern um, 
AI algorithms, um, and AI means a lot to a lot of different people, and we can dive into what that means to us, but what we've essentially done is given people the like an Alexa or a Siri type experience in their office, right? Walking into an office and saying simply like, start my meeting, right? And we've leveraged those tools to not only communicate with people, but actually to communicate with the devices. So we're using generative AI to not only build conversational back and forth with a person walking into a space, or even like a technician, how do I fix this? Or what's wrong with this? We, we certainly do that, but we also are able to generate the commands for those actual devices. So for example, I walk into a room and say, start my meeting. Well, first we interpret what that actually means. What do those words mean? And then we translate that down to a series of commands. Say, okay, well, I've got a screen in there. It needs to be on, right? It needs to be on the right input. There needs to, there's a microphone and camera. That needs to be on. It needs to be off of mute. If we're using an application, we want to launch that application. So we're actually able to build programmatically those uh, routines to, and then communicate them down to the devices. So all this stuff gets to go on behind the scenes and people uh, can really just go about their workflows and navigate those spaces using natural language um, in a really frictionless way. So I imagine for most people, right, they, they hear about this and it's a little esoteric. It's like, it's a little disconnected. It, it's sure. something that should be running in the background to make your life simple on the front end, right? Now more people are working virtual than ever. So again, maybe they're not as, you know, in as many conference rooms and, and that type right. of thing. So there's understanding the problem. And I think we all get, hey, you try going into a meeting and setting up the TV and this, that, and the other thing. And for whatever reason, this stuff never works. But right. then there's the question of just how big is this opportunity? So I'd love right. to understand how you kind of size and scope the opportunity to solve putting all of these pieces of the AV industry and getting them to actually work together for the modern workplace. Yeah, so you know when you look at total market, uh, it's, it's always an estimate, right? But um, the global estimate and how many meeting rooms, you know, meeting rooms, boardrooms, that kind of thing uh, is 15 million. So there's 15 million spaces, and as you aptly pointed out, um, the nature of work has changed quite a bit, and that's part of the problem, right? There's all these, especially in the pandemic era and post-pandemic era, which a lot of these technologies kind of came to market and flooded these spaces, because offices are used a little bit differently, right? People aren't going in and sitting in a cubicle. People aren't sitting down at a desk. Um, there's unassigned spaces. They're more dynamic. They need to be able to accommodate a Zoom call one, one minute and then a Teams call the next minute. Um, and being able to manage all of those technologies in a highly dynamic way is really what we're focused on. So um, there's a lot of rooms out there, <laughs> a lot of rooms out there. And one of the benefits that we have um, being uh, kind of industry veterans, if you will, um, we're selling NetSpeak's products to the same customers that we sold to in this, in the, I mean, quite literally this morning, I got another 20 warm intros to 15 of them were Fortune 500 companies, to decision makers that are managing pro AV estates. So, you know, we have that benefit. We're an early stage company, but I like to say we're kind of hitting the ground running um, because we have all of this uh, previous experience. So, you know, we're starting with the meeting rooms. There's a lot of meeting rooms out there. We're solving that problem. We know that problem. It's kind of low hanging fruit. But what we've done is we've built a platform to scale beyond that. So, um, a network device to us is a network device. It really doesn't matter if it's a screen, microphone and camera, or a refrigerator. It makes no difference. If that's you know a networked enabled device, we've built the platform um, to be able to scale into different areas. So think about a meeting room. That's your AV infrastructure. Natural um, next step would be going back of house, your networking infrastructure. Now what about your HVAC system in your building? What about your security system? The ability for people to simply talk to their technology and communicate their objectives and needs via spoken language and then translating that down to the devices can really be applied to any market. And it, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because we have an acute focus right now in solving the, the meeting rooms. It's, it's a known issue. But in an ideal world, we, we do that really well. And the customer says, well, uh, what about this other thing over here? And we've anticipated that, and we've built out the platform to be able to scale into these other use cases. Ideas are, you know, a dime a dozen. It <laughs> comes down to execution. You mentioned you kind of have this long track record of being in the space, so getting warm intros and, and getting clients onboarded, 
uh, mm -hmm. is moving far quicker than it would for a traditional startup. You're also certainly not necessarily trying to build a category, right? You're, you're solving an existing known pain point. Um, so a couple of things. Talk to us a little bit about kind of your past experience and the types of clients you worked with and are those you know, naturally going to onboard to want to utilize this? And then the second thing, you're going to be limited by your ability to get to those right decision makers who are making these decisions. Being at the pro AV space, I have no idea who that person is. So tell us a little bit about who the typical decision maker is at a Fortune 500 company uh, that would say, yes, we want to onboard this technology. Sure. So starting with the first question, um, I helped build uh, and grow a previous company. We grew that to about $7 million in annual revenues in the pro AV space. Um, we're anticipating doing quite a bit more with NetSpeak here. My founding team and I have worked together for uh, a decade, known for 15 years. Um, so, and we've got a, a team of advisors and directors, all, you know, kind of titans of the industry, if you will. Um, so we've surrounded ourselves with the right people. I actually did a back of the napkin between my sales VP and myself, and we've actually sold over $100 million in pro AV tech with our, you know, either directly or managing teams. Um, so we've been around it for a while and we're able to directly communicate with those, those influencers and those buyers, which are typically, you know, there's a, there's a vast array of titles, but typically they're people managing, making procurement decisions on what their estate of AV technology looks like. You know, director of digital spaces, head of AV, head of IT, there's kind of an overlap with IT there as well. So, um, you know, it's really, the people say reporting to a CIO or a CTO, making st strategic procurement decisions, trying to optimize their spaces. Um, that's typically the archetype, of, you know, the, the profile of person that we're selling to. And we've done it a lot in the past. Once you've sold into an organization, first off, you know, with many enterprises, they'll kind of say, okay, we'll adopt this for, you know, our executive team. And then if that goes well, we'll move on downwards, right? They don't want to take all the costs at once. They want to see how you actually perform. Is that the same in this space? Well, there's definitely uh, a, a, you kind of work into the project, right? It's not like you make the sale and all of a sudden, you know, you're taking all 5,000 rooms in the estate, right? So you work into it. There's typically a pilot program. You go, you know, maybe a build, particular building for a company or maybe even a floor or something like that where you start to roll it out. You start to map it into their use case, because no two projects are the same, right? So, you know, 90% of it's the same, but, you know, there's there's different workflows in different spaces. There's different um, vocabulary used in different spaces. So getting the platform acquainted with that um, is part of the process. Um, but once we once we get up and running, it's it's usually a pretty quick scale to, to going to 100%. It's not, it's not as if, you know, I've got 25 buildings, I'm going to do one, the next year I'm going to stage in another one. When, once these decisions, these are long-term planning decisions, so kind of once they're made, they're kind of set in stone. Um, and, and they're done on an annualized basis. Um, so, you know, we are a SaaS company, it's just a B2B SaaS, um, pure software, there's no hardware component to what we're doing. Um, but, but it's not sold on like a monthly subscription like you would with another consumer service or something. These are long-term, typically multi-year decisions, multi-year procurement cycles. And, and once they commit to the project, um, it, it rolls out in total. In terms of the implementation, uh, how much you know, boots on the ground type of effort is involved in making sure you're actually hooking the software up correctly to all of these different devices, you know, whether it's the microphone, the camera, and the, right. you know, the television, so on and so forth? Yeah, so in, in the ecosystem, there's a few different players. There's vendors, such as NetSpeak, there's end users, and then there's managed service providers. We call them system integrators. Those are the people on the ground actually deploying the technology, managing procurement, uh, managing, uh, you know, fixing things when they break. Um, so they're really the people that are hands-on. NetSpeak's providing a tool. Right, so of course, as a vendor, we will support that tool, we will make sure that tool works, but we don't get involved with the hands-on of actually deploying it, if that makes sense. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, now, in not being kind of hands-on in the deployment, so that'll go into whoever is managing the infrastructure of that office space. Um, do you have any experience you can speak to in terms of 
you know, feedback you're getting from beta clients saying, oh my God, this is making our lives so much easier. This works so much better. And a concrete example would be great, again, just because this is something that's a little more detached from maybe some of our everyday right. lives to really understand what it looks like. Right, yeah, I mean, it, 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 I'll use an example that I had alluded to in the, just asset tracking. I mean, not even, you know, the, the person, the salesperson walking into a meeting room trying to start a meeting, all the stuff kind of back of house, if you will, for the, right. the IT, the support team, just proper asset tracking. Again, you, you, you'd be shocked if you understood the nature of how, how it is now. So you have a tool where I can go, I can, and, and there's software running on my network that's auditing this, and you mean I can push a button and I can spit out an, an asset report that I can kick over to accounting to do my annual depreciation? Like, I don't mm. have that right now. So yeah. just the fact that I have that is a huge win. We've built, um, one of the things that resonates with more of those, you know, the, the, the people on the ground, the technicians moving around the spaces, you know, they're frantic. They're running into a space. Everybody's staring at them, right? Because their meeting isn't working and they're trying to solve something. Well, one of the things that we've built into the platform is you're able to ask our, uh, our assistant, which we call Lena, think of it like an Alexa or Siri, Lena's Language Enabled Network Assistant. So heavy on the acronym there. But, um, you know, you're able to just ask Lena, how do I do this? How do I set the aspect ratio? How do I get this thing off of mute? And Lena will instantly understand what devices are in that room, look through, read every single page of every single manual, look mm -hmm. at previous support tickets, even if you need to pull a device log or something like that. And, and you know, in an instant, say, oh, on page 63 of this manual, uh, here's the steps uh, to, to, to take this thing off of mute or to set the IP address or to do something, you know, technical. That resonates. When we show that to people, I mean, their jaws drop. It's like, this is going to save me so much time, so much hassle, so much confusion. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very tactile. You see it. You, you can use it. And so, so there's, like, foundational things like that that aren't really in front of the sales or marketing person walking into a room and just asking it to start. But the people really struggling with the deployment and management of these technologies, they see some of these core features, and they, it, they instantly get it. It looks like in Q4 of this year, you know, you're obviously a, a very young startup, but I know, A, you've been in the industry for a very long time. B, the technology is fully built out. Um, so you're beginning to go to market. What does, you know, initial traction look like? Do you have some beta clients going yep. online right now? Yep. We're engaged with those design partners right now. Um, we're, you know, my, my go to market, if you will, is to, over the next few months, go through that beta program with those design, you know, building technology and deploying technology are really two different things. And we're not naive to that. We've done this before. We know it's a process. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping by the end of the year to have 800 rooms, um, either a combination of in operation or in, you know, in pilot, rolling out, that kind of thing. So, you know, three design partners, 250-ish rooms each is kind of our sweet set before, before we really scale up to some of the larger accounts, right? Because we want to we want to we want to learn from that process, you know, candidly, um, and uh, get that feedback incorporated in the platform so that we can scale it. We're we're right now slated to show at the beginning of February in the largest kind of international pro AV show, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so we're going to have a physical presence there. Um, we're starting the conversations with some of, some of those larger accounts, those fortune accounts, um, a lot of household names in there, um, because there's a sales cycle to it. You know, it's, it's, these are big decisions. These are long-term procurement decisions. It could take you six or 12 months before you, you know, b between your first point of contact and your check, <laughs> really. Right. So, so we're starting those conversations now. Um, with the larger organizations, simultaneous to running the beta with our design partners. So really, beginning of next year, we're, you know, we're off to the races, and uh, we're very excited about it. It sounds like it, it is you know, a fairly straightforward SaaS-type fee. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the size of you know, an annual contract, okay, well, it takes you 12 months, like that might not feel good but then if you understand how large the numbers could be on a contract that might feel good so Absolutely. talk to us a little bit about kind of the average 
you know, size contract you're looking to close? And is it, you know, multi-year, which means there's more stickiness and they're not going to be turning over? What does that look like? Yeah, so our, our, our pricing ballpark, of course, um, you can think about it on a per, we price on a per room basis. So it's very easy to, you know, to quantify. Um, yeah. You know, five, six hundred bucks a room per year. So, you know, you can, you can do the math on that very quickly. So annual, annual contract size, you know, anywhere from on the smaller side, $150,000, $200,000 a year, upwards into millions of dollars for some of the larger contracts. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, the checks take a lot of work to get, um, but they're big. And one of, the beauty, uh, one, of the, one of the beauties of this model is it is a pure SaaS model, but the industry procures on annualized, if not multi-year contracts. Um, mm -hmm. In my previous company, we sold management tools for our specific hardware and customers would procure annually, uh, usually three years actually, Chris, in advance, um, you get a big check up front, um, and you're able to leverage that from a cash flow perspective to help grow the business, but then of course, um, you know, account for it on an accrual basis throughout the, the, the term of the agreement. But it is, um, it is a cash up front business, which is really nice. I'm curious why, you know, no one has solved this problem before. Why is it that your team has come along and been able to figure out this thing that has just plagued so many offices and people working in offices for decades and decades. Right. Yeah. Why net speak? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So there, there are incumbents and they're, they fall into a couple categories. Um, vendors have man, every vendor has some sort of management tool, right? Some sort of tab on a browser that I can go and look at to some extent. Uh, what what uh, what I have, but that's restricted to that particular vendor's equipment. And there's really no incentive for them to expand into, you know, expand that offering into competitive products. What's what's the value for them there? Um, those managed service providers that I referred to earlier, um, there are some of the large ones. I mean, these are billion-dollar companies, multi-billion-dollar companies that you've never heard of um, mm -hmm. at providing these managed services. Uh, they have a lot of homegrown solutions to try to do multi-device management. Um, you know, it's their business, but they're not software companies. And quite frankly, the software is lacking. And um, almost by design, because they're managed services companies. And I know, I know a lot of the people that work at these companies, and for every dollar they might get in a license for their management tool, they're selling a seat at you know, $4 or $5 for someone uh, to go and uh, sit in an office with, or you know, have a seat in that office physically in order to manage that network and to deploy and implement that software. So there's really no incentive on them making really good software that kind of takes that out of the equation because that's their primary revenue stream is those managed services dollars. And there are some pure staff companies that um, have tried to tackle this. Um, it gets very technical very quickly. Um, about kind of how our approach and how we're leveraging the um, generative AI in order to kind of bridge the gap between language and device control. Um, but nonetheless, those existing uh, SaaS companies don't benefit from that. Um, they're 10-year-old they're SaaS companies. They're on old software architecture, and you can't just drop this technology into it. In fact, there was a big acquisition last week. HP just uh, purchased one of the companies that I would have considered a competitor. Mm. Uh, so there's definitely M&A activity going on. There's definitely value. Um, but it's 10-year-old it's software that doesn't benefit from some of these novel technologies. And it's, you know, I kind of use cars as an equation. It's like having a, uh, you know, having a Honda Accord with a four-cylinder engine. You're not going to go drop a V8 into that and expect it to work, right? You have to upgrade the suspension. You have to upgrade the braking. You have to upgrade the steering. Yeah, it's a system, right? Software, in some senses, is very is, is very similar. And as much as everyone wants to kind of be part of the quote unquote AI revolution and include some, it, it's not like you can just throw it in there and make it work. You re, you really have to rearchitect the whole system. And what we've we've benefited from kind of being in the right place at the right time, where we we're already working on this problem. It's a very hard problem to solve. Some of these new technologies came out and made a big impact. We realized that it was kind of the missing piece, and then we've we've since built the entire the entire solution around that. You're raising capital right now in WeFunder. Uh, how will that capital be utilized to grow the business going forward? 
Yeah, business at our stage, it is really just um, our, our, our largest cost is our people, right? Building product, deploying product. Our cost of goods as a, as a software company is fairly low, um, so we don't really have to buy any heavy equipment. We don't have to buy inventory. We don't have to do any of that. It's really just putting people in seats to make the, uh, in our seats, uh, to make the product as, as good as possible um, and to get it in front of it as many customers as possible. In two to three years, what does success look like for NetSpeak? <laughs> uh, well, we're all sitting on a, on a private island uh, drinking martinis all day. No, <laughs> no, of course not. Um, I, I, think, I think we've got an opportunity to grow this uh, fairly quickly. Again, it's, it's kind of an extension of all the work uh, that we've done over our careers to date. We have a very clear kind of product market fit. We've got a very clear go to market. Um, so, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to get this uh, company ramped up. My goal for next year is, you know, if I get six customers and a million and a half in recurring revenue, you know, we're off to the races. That's a fantastic start. Let's just keep multiplying that year over year over year. You know, typical SaaS company, three, three years, year over year for the first couple of years. So if we get a business in three years, uh, we're doing 15, you know, $20 million in annual uh, revenue, we're, we're, we're in a very happy place. Awesome. Well, I want to give you the last word here for those who are interested or maybe even on the line. Um, you know, what would you say to them to kind of convince them and get them over the line? <laughs> Um, I think there's, there's no doubt that AI is going to change not only the nature of work, but just how we communicate with each other, how we go about our daily lives. I think we're at the very early stages of figuring out how that is actually going to change things. Um, but it's very evident that any business is looking at how they can apply this technology to make their organization function more efficiently. Um, we find ourselves in the right place at the right time. We're not a company uh, that's coming out of a dorm room, a bunch of smart guys building, building cool technology and looking where to put it, right? We were already working on this problem. We realized that we could do it in this unique and novel way, leveraging some of these technologies. And we already have that kind of running start. We have the go-to-market, we have the customer base. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's very timely given I mean, quite literally this morning, I, I was given 20 intros to companies that you would, uh, you would know. Um, so we have that, and we're going to leverage that as much as possible and to make this success. If you liked what you heard on the show today, you can check out more deal details at kingscrowd.com. And you can now invest on WeFunder until January 17th, 2025. And please like, subscribe, and share a podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so more listeners like you can find us. Thanks for listening.